fish cast onto the shore, several times caught in a net and several times able to escape. I want to report a finding, put forward the content of my belly as proof of my existence before the collapse of the world. What spills out first are bodily juices. The skin resists at first, but doesn't have to be persuaded for long. Then remove a few innards, which are no good to me anyway. If they are jumbled around, it won't matter at all. Sift through several useless bits, subjects without faces. Throw off the junk, used things. Sift through the sand collected from the bottom. Seaweed and skeletons of smaller fish. Do not be discouraged by the disgust of the research terrain. In the middle of all this, during a concentrated search, you find an identity card and several other personal items. A shoe, a pen, a notebook with smeared pages, a dictaphone, a telephone that is still ringing, newspapers from last week, a box with personal items, an eyeglasses case, a set of cutlery in a plastic package, a tuft of hair that fell out this morning while I was brushing it, hand cream, a sack of nuts. A calendar reveals my night and day shifts, wallet proof of purchases for the family, crumpled paper in the side pocket, dismissal from work in two months. There is confusion underwater. The sea is packing for a journey elsewhere. The move is not exactly peaceful. I told myself, I'll take a break for a while. I'll find a calm place somewhere beyond the shore. But even at the shore, there was nervousness. The waves and sea foam probably soaked it up. And so I forgot for a moment that I have fins and tried to use them like feet, flippers. And I got all the way to the shore like that, exhausted, injured, with an open belly, in my enthusiasm I didn't even feel the pain. Just then a dog ran past. It picked me up in its teeth, quite gently, and carried me to the edge of the beach and the brushwood. It probably would have devoured me on the spot. I could smell its hunger. But a man with a stick started to run towards him. The dog turned tail and was gone. The man took me in his hand. He didn't pay me much attention, so that offended me a little. And he hurriedly stuck me into a plastic bag. I spent the next 20 minutes there, in the company of old boots and a blanket, soaked in something. I longed for the water again. When I was finally set down, I was at the gatehouse on a bench. The man probably went to empty his bladder. And then suddenly, I felt someone's gaze on me. A man in a white coat pulls me out of the bag. He looks at me, expertly, as if an artefact. He carries me through a hallway, then by the elevator to the first floor. He opens a door and brings me among young people sitting in rows and chairs. He sets me on a table. He then draws something on a board. Its shape somewhat resembles me. He then has me passed around. I go from hand to hand. No one handles me with care. He can be sure of that. Two teenagers use me to scare a classmate and she is as white as a sheet. A bell rings. The teacher announces that after the break, we will look inside. Just then, a pair of hands puts me under a sweater. My new owner runs off somewhere. His whole body is trembling. I hear a female voice. The young man is kissing the girl somewhere behind a building, ringing. They bring me back inside. Both of them are laughing. They whisper something. A man in a suit approaches and the boy and girl run away laughing. The floor is cold. I imagine the sea as I remember it. All those noisy boats and oil spills that every fish must know how to avoid. 
or floating bodies. Fishermen with bait, large nets, fish farms, even my own image on cans with shredded fish meat. And so I lie here and say, I got stuck in an elevator on my way home from work. I was returning from a 12 hour shift, completely exhausted. I was carrying the shopping, two full bags of it. And I'd put everything that I didn't fit into them in my rucksack. Blisters were forming on my hands from carrying these heavy items. But at home, they simply regarded it as one of my duties. Mother provides food and everything else necessary for the household. When I got home, I would have liked nothing more than to have collapsed into bed. Or even onto the carpet, simply to lie for a moment with closed eyes in the quiet. But instead, turn off the washing machine, clean the apartment, begin cooking dinner, go to the post office if necessary, ring a repairman, listen to his excuses and make him a coffee, as though it were nothing to converse with man. Show an interest in how he is and how things are going at work and still look good. Help the children with their homework and evening hygiene. Clean up and prepare things for the morning. And the next day, get up at 5.30am and go to work where the boss is worrying about whether everything will be done and hopes that I can work overtime that this job can't wait and that it is enshrined in my contract and that there is a queue of people who would be more than happy to take over immediately. But right now I'm in an elevator that's stuck. It's surprisingly quiet here. I press the buttons, but there's no response. I put my bags on the floor and sit down between them. I think about all the things I still have to do, and in what order, and what a rush I'm in. But in a moment, the anxiety will pass. The elevator situation remains unchanged. And suddenly I have the feeling that there is nowhere to rush, when even the elevator is motionless. The fact that I am here is not my fault. It's the fault of this machine, which is against me and my duties. Or perhaps on my side? Is the elevator the only one that understands me? Was it the elevator that wanted to grant me at least a moment's repose? I lie down, a bag under my head, covered with a newspaper and a sweater from my office, and fall asleep happily. Submerge your face in cold water. Remain as long as your body allows. As soon as you are underwater, open your eyes. Try to map out the situation. How long and wide the sink is. How its walls are. Would it be possible to climb out? Or are they too slippery? Imagine that what is protruding from the water is no longer your body that it doesn't belong to you. You do not have to worry about its needs at the moment. Concentrate on the head that is stuck between the left and right walls of the sink. It has neither arms nor legs to climb out with. It can only look out or crawl. But then water will get in your mouth. Container two. Stick your head under water. Pretend you were just quickly rinsing it. Something touches your face. You open your eyes and see a school of fish. A moment of panic. You try to lift your head above the surface, but your head is suddenly unusually heavy. You have to employ all of your effort to get it back above the surface. When you're finally out of the sink, it looks empty. It's scraped up inside, along the sides. Someone probably dropped something heavy in there. 
you are compelled to verify that you didn't just imagine it and to dive back in, interested in what kind of fish those were and how many are there, but you're afraid that the water will not let you out again. You wait a moment. It's good to consider things a bit. Container 3. Basin. There is a herbal bath in a basin, something that your doctor prescribed for you, for relaxation, for your nerves, to sleep well. You don't know if it is only the power of suggestion, but you actually have the feeling that the bath washes all worries and fear from you. You feel sleepy, but you know that water is not the safest terrain for such a state. Exercise four, no container. You are standing in front of a shop selling fish. There is a large aquarium in the display. Whereas the fish inside the shop are intended for quick consumption or freezing, these have received the opportunity to create an advertisement for other fish bodies. You wonder at this strange kind of luck. Besides several artificial stones, the aquarium is empty. There is nothing to hide behind or in. You feel as if they are watching you and that they want something from you. You miss your tram. You feel your fate is to stay there and find a way to help both them and those inside. But then you remember that there are deadlines tomorrow and you've got to go home. Exercise five, opening a fish. Seventh grade, biology lesson, dissection. Participation is required. Whoever does not participate will be graded accordingly. You're in a group with a student who obviously has no problem with dissection. They're even somehow excited by it, probably not from digging into a foreign body itself, but rather because they are aware of what an unpleasant feeling it can cause for you. During the break, they throw the fish at your chair. You then do not want to sit there until the teacher insists that you take your seat, otherwise there will be consequences and you obey. Exercise six. You walk past large tubs. There's a stench coming from them. Fish are huddled around the hose through which the air enters the tub. On a sign is written, tomorrow last day, fish half off. You think about what kind of queue there will be tomorrow and how quickly the tub will be empty. You watch the fish and try to distinguish them from each other. If you could stay here longer and observe them for some time, you'd be able to recognise them, one from another. You'd be able to name them according to size, eyes, shade of scales, but also according to their extent of injury. The fish have numerous abrasions. Exercise seven. You're returning home, worn out, with overflowing shopping bags. You think about what is waiting for you at home and everything you will still have to do. And that a second shift awaits you that no one sees and no one appreciates. You got into the elevator as usual. You had to hold the doors for the elevator to start at all. Between the third and fourth floors, the elevator suddenly stops. You try pressing various buttons. You call out and bang the doors and then repeatedly press the bell. But it seems that the button is wiggling, strangely, that it might not even be connected. Your mobile phone has been dead since lunch, when your colleague borrowed your charger and didn't return it. You wait a while longer, occasionally calling out, but then you lie on the ground. You put a jacket and a newspaper under your head, spilling shopping bags around you. The little orange fish you are carrying for your son in a sack of water also looks resigned. If you don't get home soon, it will soon be out of breath in the water. You cover yourself a little with the newspapers, 
your eyelids are starting to droop. Maybe the elevator isn't broken at all, but only wanted to give you a moment's rest. The question is for how long? Exercise eight, rag on the floor. There are days when you feel like a rag on the floor and when your environment also behaves towards you in the same way. There is no point in rehearsing it. Such days simply appear two or three or more times in a month as a rule. Exercise nine, you've burned your hand while cooking. You're thinking about how to pay that debt. You pour cold water on it, but it's hurting more and more. They've already sent you several reminders. You always have to force yourself to open the envelope. You often imagine reopening it and seeing a big zero there or an apology from the financial office that it was a mistake. Or your children admit to you that it was just a joke and they wrote it. Exercise 10. Your partner tells you that he would like to have fish. You've been feeling sick, imagining it since morning. You cannot tell him that it is like throwing yourself into a pot. It would seem weird at the very least. You are standing in front of the huge tank of fish in the shop and you say, 